Um, the, first of the first half of the day is dedicated to labor law, but you see there's much more to labor law, and um, I'll have, make a few quick introductory remarks for our speaker today, and then he will have the floor. And so here we go. It is an old hat that labor lawyers have always had to see more. Labor lawyers have always had to see the bigger picture, the elephant in the room, the global economy, division of labor, financialization of the firm, the transformation of work, decollectivization, state transformation, and globalization, while paying attention to every detail, employment standards, declining industrial citizenship, picketing rules. Whereas we would expect constitutional theorists to be naturally tasked with keeping both a bird's and an ant's eye view to the governing principles as well as to the nitty-gritty microfacts of social interaction from the bottom up, this is surely what labor lawyers have accepted to be a base necessity. Without keeping both levels on your radar, there is no valid expectation of an adequate assessment of what the world of work actually looks like. Many of the lessons of legal realism, law and context, or law, of law and society that turn out to either have been otherwise hard learned or repeatedly forgotten or ignored by most lawyers, have long seemed entirely obvious to labor lawyers. To them, the idea must seem so self-explanatory that every aspect of an employment contract, a negotiation regime, a claimed property right, or an invoked right to strike is intertwined within themselves unstable regulatory regimes, rules, and principles. The elephant in the room is always the current state of market organization, the degree to which public interest intervention is politically embraced or rejected, the degree to which the market is part of a global, spatialized world market, the degree to which state, oh yeah, that's not good. Okay. It said the compute, well, you saw it too, fine. To which the market is part of this global, spatialized world market, the degree to which state organizations, domestic or international, feel empowered to maintain, reform, or initiate regulatory interventions. The key word here, well, Stephen, we couldn't stop it. The varieties of capitalism. The degree to which and the forms how labor markets are correlated in different forms to, pro to product markets and volatile regulatory arrangements that we have been labeling mixed economy under globalized conditions, flex security, or responsabilization. There is no respite, no safe haven, no downtime for a labor lawyer's survey of the lay of the land, the mapping of the territory. We are always, already and constantly waiting for the barbarians. And as in Kotsia's novel, we have the growing feeling that it's no longer possible to look from a secure, pure vantage point, let's say on the welfare state, into the twilight and mist where the unknown enemy, the supposedly other, is waiting for us. One of the most memorable moments in saint exupery Le Petit Prince must be the way in which the little prince can see things which are either hidden to the pilot, namely the elephant, or which he sees differently, the old hat. Both of them look at a snake, but what's inside is different to each one of them. The little prince at the same time is an utterly sad book. The melancholy that pervades the story from the beginning does not let up, but instead prevails right to the end. Labor law, we could say, is much about looking, seeing, and, in fact, seeing differently, and about seeing, well, different things. As in Saint-Exupéry, it seems that labor law would only appear to be about doing this or that, while it is really much more about seeing, namely connections, patterns, and manifestations. So the issue is one of seeing more, of seeing differently, and seeing with a purpose, one of analysis and understanding, which always meant to recognize the bigger picture, which means to be attentive to the loud and the quiet, the dominating and the silent, the winners and the losers. One of the things which strike any reader of Harry Arthur's enormous scholarly and practice-related work is the wide scope of perception, observation, analysis, and interpretation. Where one progressive lawyer sees bargaining asymmetry, he sees inequality. Where one lawyer says the growing prevalence of private contractual governance, he sees a longer standing privatization and contractualization of former government services. Where one sees globalization, he sees its origins and its consequences within the domestic context. Where one sees the decline of labor law and deunionization, 
he sees labor law's revival as the law of economic subordination and resistance. Where one sees, then, particular compartmentalized instantiations of weakened labor and employment law, he points to the bigger picture of financial globalization, state transformation, and the hollowing out of the mind. In best critical fashion, Harry Arthas always points to the context, the circumstances and conditions which govern and shape a certain situation, a conflict and an outcome. Where others offer descriptions, often enough in an increasingly resignative manner, he emphasizes the entry points for critique, for alternative accounts, for counter-narratives and counter-proposals, in short, for agency. Harry's call to arms, however, is never exuberant, never confident in the belief in success. Instead, it's reflective, cautious, and measured. And yet, it is forceful, fearless, and prompting engagement. Harry Arthas, who will give today's inaugural distinguished lecture of the Transnational Law Institute, which is the umbrella organization for the Summer Institute, in Transnational Labor Law, is Professor Law Emeritus of Oscott Hall Law School in Toronto, the former Dean of Oscott Hall, and the former President of York University in Toronto, Canada. Educated at the University of Toronto and at Harvard Law School, he holds multiple honorary degrees and prestigious, received prestigious prizes and recognitions, including the Decent Work Research Prize jointly awarded to him and Joseph Stieglitz by the International Labor Organization in 2008. He has held visiting professorships and distinguished visitorships at law schools and universities around the world, including here in the UK, numerous institutions, including Cambridge and Oxford, then in Sydney in Australia, again UCL here in London and the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. It is not an easy task to adequately even try to capture the breadth as well as the depths of Professor Arthur's scholarly, academic, institutional, professional and political engagement as well as impact. With deep footing in at least two not often connected core uh, fields of law, namely administrative law and labor law, Harry Arthas has chaired and steered a number of direction-setting expert commissions on labor and pension law, and is today one of the most highly regarded institutional thinkers with the most highly admired and respected expertise and leadership in university reform and legal education. A scholarly writer of wonderful poise, wit, and sharpness, as you will have seen, Harry is the author of one of the classics in the field of legal pluralism with his 1985 book, Without the Law, Administrative Justice and Legal Pluralism in 19th Century England. The meticulous, insightful study of the emerging forms of commercial and administrative relations laid the groundwork for Harry's continuing engagement with legal pluralism as a method, a mapping exercise, and a normative commitment. As begun in Without the Law, Arthur's engagement with social legal studies and legal anthropology, which he displays in many writings throughout his career, paves the way and pushes a legal pluralist analysis of labor and employment law, which has so far been unmatched. Though his conversation and engagement with major path-breaking scholars in legal anthropology and the sociology of law, such as Sally Fogg Moore, Boa Santos, Rod MacDonald, or Gunter Teubner, Arthas brings labor into the legal pluralist fold in a way which then allows him to trace the subtle lines of continuity between the domestic and the transnational manifestations of labor and employment law pluralism. Full stop. As you will hear, as you will hear. Go on, go on. Okay, a little more then. As you will hear in a few minutes, which is basically one and a half minutes, it is never just about the field or the doctrine, a case or its interpretation. We are instead urged by Harry Arthas to ask questions about whether law can actually do the job, whether we are looking in the right direction when expecting legal, social, and political change from the courts. He tells us with increasing emphasis that we should not congratulate ourselves on court victories but keep an open and critical eye to what is actually going on in economic and social relations today, relations that we must capture through a transnational lens. Through an ever-sharpening perspective on the political economy of public-private governance, the market emerges as nothing else but the battlefield, the site of engagement and contestation. From the dual perspective, that of a public and a private lawyer, of administrative and labor law governance, the dynamics of a market sphere that is shaped today by the tension between domestic policy choices and a globalizing political economy constitute a formidable research project. 
at an interest, add an interest then from the start in legal education, the legal profession, and the prospects of critical interdisciplinary pedagogy and challenge, and you have some of the building blocks in place. And it does warrant emphasis that this tension captured already in Without the Law as one between legal centrism and legal pluralism <coughs> did have and continues to have tremendous implications for the study of law, especially in a transnational context. It suggests to us that a better understanding of what law is and how it operates in society requires more than reading statutes and cases, what is sometimes called black letter law, but requires nothing so short of a serious engagement with the social sciences, economics, sociology, psychology, anthropology, and of course, history. Testimony to the power of this insight is that today we have entire fields of study described as law and economics, law and society, law and anthropology, and so many other subdisciplines, some new ones of which you hopefully will help develop. By no exaggeration, Harry functioned as a founder, facilitator, and driver of these fields and approaches in Canadian scholarship. And it's difficult to overstate his influence on its development over the past decades. In fact, legal academics and jurists were already using these social sciences and related fields in their work, but failing to recognize it. We are all pluralists now. Harry, we are very, very grateful for your contribution to the Summer Institute, and you have the floor. I, I knew I would have a hard time this morning after yesterday's wonderful presentation by Boa and, and the commentators on Boa's work. Uh, and then, as this morning began and, and Pear rehearsed everything I was going to say and threatened to stop, uh, I said to him, go on, and he went on and completed his, his review of my, of my text. So I thank him very much. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> and do you mind moving a little further to the left? Okay. I think that's because there's one more microphone. Where is my, my, is this better? This is. And we'll hope that, just don't throw it. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm tempted. I'm tempted simply to, to stop now with a heavy little discussion, a cup of coffee, would make for a very restful morning. I know you've got a busy day. Uh, but Pear probably would, you know what he does when he gets angry and wants you to do something, he claps his hands loudly. And <laughs> I've, I've experienced 10 years of Pears pushing me around. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to run the risk again. So what I'm going to do in this talk uh, is, is in a small way to do what, what Boa did yesterday, which is to, to talk about how I came to write something, a particular piece, nothing nearly as ambitious or important as towards a new common sense, but, but it's what I'm doing these days. And I thought that by explaining how I came to write a particular article and where it sits in the trajectory of my work, uh, that I might, uh, what I'm doing might resonate with what you're doing. Because all of you, I know, are, are producing dissertations or writing articles. Uh, and uh, for all of you, it's somewhat early in your career, but you will be confronting, as I was, the challenge of rethinking the premises on which you began your scholarly careers. So I, I just want to, uh, in a, I, I hope, uh, accessible way, tell you a little bit about how my thinking evolved. And I'm going to start with one of my more recent pieces, which I think you've been asked to read the law of economic subordination and resistance. I hope that by doing so, I will be able to shed some light, not only on my own field of labor law, but on the larger problem 
of how legal fields or domains of legal knowledge come into existence, change, become obsolete, and in the end are either transformed or superseded altogether. I will be talking about labor law, but I hope you will be thinking about transnational law. I'm going to try to persuade you that the invention and transformation of these two fields have something in common, but I'm going to go further. I hope to convince you that their ultimate fate is decided by some of the very same forces. Transnational law, I'm going to argue, can only survive if it learns lessons from the short, sad history of labor law. So to begin at the beginning, as Per has told you, as I've acknowledged, I'm a labor lawyer. For much of my early career, I tried conscientiously not only to show how the present law fails to produce logical, just, and workable outcomes, but also to propose new legal arrangements that would be, I thought, in everyone's interest. Most of my colleagues were doing the same thing, though of course we didn't always agree either on the critique or on our proposals for reform. We had some good ideas. We tried hard to persuade people to adopt those ideas, and sometimes we even succeeded. But gradually it became obvious that even our best ideas, even ideas that judges and legislators adopted and translated into law, did not necessarily make the world a better place for workers nor did the adoption of new international norms and constitutional protections for workers, nor did the election to office of labor-friendly political parties. Admittedly, I'm a slow learner. However, in the end, I came to accept that law lacks the capacity to fundamentally alter power relations. Those relations are ultimately determined not by law but by political economy. And they are found not in the law reports or statute books, but embedded in cultural practices and social structures. No silver bullet with law written on it, I came to feel, would fundamentally alter labor markets or relations of employment. Law's contribution would be very much at the margins. Workers would only get the rights they were prepared to struggle for. <coughs> well, they struggled and they lost. At least in the global north, the labor movement is almost everywhere in retreat. Union membership, power, and influence are all declining rapidly. In some cases, they are near the vanishing point. Labor and social democratic parties are able to remain credible only if they abandon their historic values, alliances, and programs. The welfare state has been fatally weakened by 40 years of ascendant neoliberalism and more recently by the force majeure of austerity. Labor market institutions and regulatory agencies are in disarray, often understaffed and disempowered. Workers' share of GDP is diminishing. Wages have lagged inflation. Some combination of precarious employment, underemployment, and unemployment afflicts almost all advanced economies. The result, as we all know, is that these economies are growing more and more unequal, and the problems of economic subordination are growing more severe. How can we explain these developments? Globalization, technology, market fundamentalism, these are the most obvious causes. However, one more cause occurred to me, which I explored in an essay 
entitled Labor Law After Labor? Question mark. I suggested that labor is no more. It's no longer a sociological descriptor. Workers now tend to self-identify as members of the middle class rather than the working class, as consumers rather than producers. They mobilize politically around issues of race, religion, national identity, or lifestyle, not the defense of their class interests. And working class culture has been absorbed into a commercialized popular culture. Worse yet, labor is no longer a matter of urgent public concern. So far as I know, hardly any newspaper in the United Kingdom or North America has a labor specialist. In many jurisdictions, labor is no longer a freestanding field of public policy. Many governments have assigned the functions of their labor departments to ministries of welfare or economics. Decisions made by finance and trade and industry departments turn out to be far more consequential for workers' well-being than anything that happens in whatever ministry now has formal responsibility for employment standards or collective bargaining. And to my great distress, labor is no longer as popular an academic subject as once it was. In business schools, courses in labor or industrial relations have given way to courses in human resource management. In many law schools, labor law is either not taught, taught by practitioners rather than tenured scholars, or disaggregated into specialist regulatory subjects such as pension law or discrimination law. And now a question that truly pains me to ask. What is the future for a legal field called labor law in which the law is designed to protect people who no longer think of themselves as labor and in which the very concept of labor is disappearing from public, from political, from academic discourse? And the answer pains me even more than the question. The future is not a bright future. <coughs> I'll return to this theme in a moment, but first I want to point to two great anomalies in the present situation. First, the disappearance of labor and the decline of labor law's importance coincide with a period during which in many advanced economies, labor has acquired more formal legal rights than it ever enjoyed before. In my own country, Canada, for example, the courts have decided that labor's right to organize, to bargain collectively, to strike, and to picket are all protected by the Constitution. And parallel developments have taken place in the space governed by transnational law, where recognition of labor rights has expanded enormously. And now the second anomaly. During the same period, while labor's social, economic, and political influence have been deteriorating, labor law scholarship has been flourishing. It's become more theoretically and methodologically sophisticated and diverse. It's begun to address law at every level, from the indigenous law of the workplace to national systems of labor market regulation to the domain of transnational labor and social rights. And it's belatedly begun to explore the problems of previously neglected worker cohorts, such as migrant workers, domestic workers, and those engaged in non-waged work. Perhaps these two anomalies lend credibility to my thesis that struggle, not law, ultimately defines the rights that workers actually enjoy. In any event, I'm sure you'll understand why I've been feeling recently that my intellectual life savings, which are almost entirely invested in labor law, 
are very much at risk. So how did this happen, I asked myself. Am I the victim of historical trends rather than poor personal judgment? In order to answer this question, I decided to revisit the history of labor law. When and why did it emerge? When and why did it flourish? When and why did it decline? Some answers to these questions are found in the piece that you were asked to read, The Law of Economic Subordination and Resistance. I'll summarize them very quickly. Labor law began as an academic discipline and field of professional legal practice in the 1920s, a response to the social upheavals of the late 19th century, to the Great War and the Russian Revolution, and to widespread outbreaks of proletarian discontent. It took on special <coughs> urgency during the Great Depression of the 1930s and really came into its own during the period between 1945 and 1960 when unions gained power and legitimacy as part of what is known as the post-war settlement. By about 1960, even conservative law faculties, law publishers, and lawyers organizations were prepared to acknowledge labor law as a legitimate field of legal learning and practice. I just intervene or a point of local information, the first labor lawyers were appointed to Oxford and Cambridge about 1960. It's very, very recent in, in terms of the history of those distinguished faculties. However, in the 1970s, the post-war settlement began to unravel. Over the next four decades, as I've mentioned, globalization, technology, market fundamentalism, the disappearance of working class identity and solidarity have combined to launch unions on a long downward trajectory from which they may never recover. With the decline in unions has come a decline in labor's political and economic power, and that decline has in turn undermined labor law as a living enterprise. After all, who's interested in advocating and designing and administering and studying and practicing a field of law whose output is likely to be frustration and disappointment? So labor law has had a fairly short life in historical terms, as well as an often unhappy life. But wait, could things have turned out differently? Better for workers, better for society, better for labor lawyers like me. This is the point of my article in which I introduce my thought experiment, my historical counterfactual. The counterfactual is something that might plausibly have happened but didn't happen. Suppose I conjecture that instead of inventing a legal regime that had only to do with labor, we had created something more ambitious, a field of law that was concerned not just with employment, but with all forms of economic subordination. As I point out, conceivably, this might have happened during the 1930s when a wide variety of people, workers, small business people, farmers, consumers, investors, were all recognized to be suffering as a result of a crisis of unregulated capitalism and inept governance. America, in fact, came quite close to responding to their plight by adopting just that kind of, of statute. Uh, they attempted to enact something called the NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1935, which is one version of my law of economic subordination and resistance. Other countries, including Canada, might have followed 
if the American experiment had succeeded. But the NIRA was struck down by the US Supreme Court. Some parts of it were reintroduced in piecemeal fashion, including what came to be known as the National Labor Relations Act, which has governed American labor law since then. But the Great Depression in due course gave way to preparations for war, and then the war itself and post-war reconstruction. So my counterfactual, of course, by definition, never happened. But could it happen today? Could it happen today? Is the current crisis of capitalism comparable to that of the 1930s? And might a new legal field called the law of economic subordination and resistance have something to contribute to the resolution of that crisis? Let's pursue those questions and see where they take us. The last question first. In my article, <clears throat> I stress the conceptual incoherence of labor law, which consists, at least in most con common law countries, of bits and pieces of private and public law, of general law and special statutes, which express very different value assumptions and use different conceptual vocabularies, but which are deemed to be core elements of labor law because they happen to address the same phenomenon, the employment relation. But if that's the criterion for inclusion in the domain of labor law, why not many other things that seldom find their way onto the labor law curriculum or the dockets of labor law practitioners? Why not trade law and immigration? that significantly influence the balance of power in the labor market? Why not tax or corporate law that establish the dynamic of business decisions that in turn lead to the hiring or firing of thousands of workers? Why not the laws that govern technical training and, and, and retirement security, social housing and health care that at one remove but with great power help to determine what social goods will be provided by the employer, what by the state, and what by workers themselves. <laughs> so, labor law is incoherent. Would the law of economic subordination and resistance be any less so? The underlying theme of my counterfactual is that gross disparities of economic power are inherent in capitalism, and that certain generic <coughs> legal technologies can and should be used to reduce those disparities or to mitigate their harmful effects. The aggregation of countervailing power is one such technology. The requirement that all economic bargains should be fair and transparent. That's another technology. State imposition of minimum or standard terms is yet another. The displacement of private market provision of social goods by public provision is still another, and the list goes on. My suggestion then is that experts in the technologies of resistance might be able to show tenant groups what they can learn from labor unions, to show borrowers what they can learn from consumers. The end point of the exercise is by no means revolutionary. It's merely to save capitalism from its own excesses, which are very much in evidence today. Now, if pressed, I would have to admit that the law of economic subordination and resistance <laughs> is likely to be no more coherent than labor law. Indeed, by ignoring the very different social and economic contexts in which subordination and resistance are experienced, it might turn out to be even less coherent. <coughs> Nonetheless, it has both conceptual and practical attractions. Conceptual attractions first. The likely incoherence of my imagined law of economic subordination and resistance 
is not, I want to assure you, a mere oversight on my part, an accidental failure to integrate diverse legal and regulatory systems. Rather, it's deliberately constructed, deliberately constructed as the mirror image of our present incoherent legal system, which has been unable to perceive, let alone to link, to analyze, or respond to many important real-world social, economic, and political developments. Although these developments are clearly related in both their origins and their consequences, they are currently assigned to separate intellectual domains on the basis of a system of legal and regulatory taxonomy constructed at another moment in history and with a different set of value assumptions. Thus, the problems of consumers are characterized as contract law, of tenants as property law, of debtors as insolvency law, and of workers, of course, as labor law or employment law. Similarly, the decision-making processes by which workers' fates are determined are variously assigned to the domains of constitutional law, or administrative law, or corporations law, or securities law. However, these labels fail to capture the underlying structural pathologies of contemporary capitalism whose manifestations they represent. By contrast, descriptors such as the ones I've used, subordination, resistance, others such as precarity or exclusion, call our attention to what these problems have in common. They all arise from decades of domestic and transnational market fetishism. Admittedly, my alternative descriptors, subordination, resistance, precarity, exclusion, these have emotional resonance, but no more resonance than the terms that have been deployed to ease us gradually into the post-affluent, post-social democratic era that represents our new normal. I have in mind such reassuring terminology as smart or responsive regulation, best practices, new public management, which are designed to make us feel good about deregulation and the retreat of the state from its responsibilities to protect citizens from malfunctioning markets and malevolent corporations. Or I might mention flexibilization, responsibilization, contractualization. Such terms are used to make it appear that recent labor market and welfare reforms are not only inevitable, but logical and desirable. Who could possibly be against flexibility, against responsibility, against freely made contracts? Who indeed, except those who experience declining living standards and the resulting degradation of their family, civic, and cultural life. My point, in short, is that conceptual language can render visible or invisible, controversial or conventional, the developments it purports to describe. There is also, despite its incoherence, a distinctly practical dimension to a legal field that answers to the name of the law of economic subordination and resistance. First, it would be a response to the long-standing argument that labor law is nothing more than an attempt to claim for workers privilege, privileges that are unavailable to other groups in society. Why, for example, should workers enjoy access to special tribunals with expedited procedures and enhanced remedial powers when consumers and tenants' disputes must be dealt with through the slow, clumsy, expensive, and often ineffective procedures of the regular courts? The answer to such questions, of course, is the core notion of the law of economic subordination and resistance. 
all subordinate people should enjoy access to similar, <coughs> excuse me, similar means of resistance. Second, a related point, if other groups, such as farmers and small businesses, could realistically aspire to the social gains won by workers in the heyday of collective bargaining in the welfare state, might they not be less hostile to unions than they now are? And, th and third, perhaps it's too much to hope for, might not a broad coalition of social forces emerge from a common interest in finding ways to resist their subordination, or at least to strike a better balance between their interests and those of powerful corporations. I've used labor law to illustrate how legal fields emerge, take hold, decline, perhaps are reconstituted. This brings me finally to the business of the Summer Institute. I'll try to explain what transnational law has to do with labor law, other than it being another legal field in transition. One connection is that both fields, as Per mentioned, have been influenced by legal pluralism, by the notion that the state has no monopoly on the making of law or its implementation. I developed this article, some, this, this notion some years ago in an article entitled Labor Law Without the State. In that article, I pointed out that labor law has never been state-centered. It had always included an important element of informal and indigenous lawmaking. But as I had to acknowledge in a later article called Landscape and Memory, although labor law was an example of legal pluralism, it was nonetheless shaped by political economy, which profoundly influences power relations in labor markets and workplaces as it does in so many other contexts. My next attempt to describe transnational labor law was in a piece called Extraterritoriality by Other Means. Here I focused on the practical mechanisms by which globalization constructs its own normative systems. My subtitle was How Labor Law Sneaks Across Borders conquers mines and controls workplaces abroad, which pretty well tells my story. And finally, in a recent piece, Making Bricks Without Straw, the creation of a transnational labor regime, I try to bring together the various lines of my work. Is it possible, I ask, that my counterfactual thought experiment, the law of economic subordination and resistance, might help us to think of new ways to protect workers' interests in the context of globalization. Globalization has played a leading role in the destruction not only of national labor law systems, but also of other regimes whose ambition is to restore a measure of fairness to relations characterized by severe inequalities of economic power. We must therefore learn how to achieve social justice in the workplaces of what looks like being a permanently globalized world. However, we've been handicapped in pursuing the project by the absence of a big idea of a plausible alternative vision of economic relations. Perhaps, I speculated, our traditional focus on labor has contributed to this difficulty. Labor lawyers, I'm sure you all know at least one labor lawyer, labor lawyers generally insist that their subject is a unique, a distinct legal field. They often make their point by reminding us of the moral implication of the fact that labor is not a commodity. However, as I point out in Bricks Without Straw, this justification for labor law valorizes class membership or the employment relation 
both of which are concepts with a diminishing grip on reality. Fortunately, there is another way of looking at labor law. As I suggest in this article, the narrative of employment can be understood as just a specific instance of injustice that reinforces the case for adherence to a general principle that everyone is entitled to freedom, to dignity, to a decent life. Everyone should be treated with fairness and compassion. The ultimate value is social justice and not identity. In effect, I was offering a new ethical justification for the new legal field that I was proposing, a field built around all relations of economic subordination and all technologies of resistance. Coincidentally, this formulation also up, opened up a new possibility to expand the spatial reach of labor law. Today, many markets operate across national boundaries and require some form of transnational regulation. However, while a framework of transnational law is emerging to regulate capital and commercial markets, the regulation of labor markets has lagged badly. Worse yet, the absence of effective universal labor standards has enabled regulatory competition amongst states that are willing to attract investors by ensuring the subordination of their own workers. If workers' rights and interests were to be inscribed along with those of other subordinate groups on a comprehensive agenda of developmental and trade concerns rather than as a separate unique project called labor law, they might gain the same international visibility and transnational support that attaches to, say, environmental or health or consumer protection concerns. To do this, of course, requires a robust response to the discourse of global thought leaders who seek to normalize existing relations of subordination by demonstrating they are not only inevitable but morally defensible. I propose two related examples. According to orthodox economists, Greek pensioners deserve to suffer significant reductions in their standard of living because they have tolerated a political system characterized by corruption, tax evasion, and fiscal irresponsibility. Likewise, closer to home for me, Canadian workers deserve to see their jobs shipped off to Mexico or China because collective bargaining and tax burdens of the welfare state have led to unsustainably high labor costs in our manufacturing sector. In this fashion, the discourses of market fundamentalism and global neoliberalism legitimate a system of transnational governance in which the interests of sub subaltern groups, both labor and non-labor, receive little attention and less sympathy. Collective challenges to this way of thinking are a necessary first step towards alternative models of capitalism and of global governance. Which brings me, at last, to the prospects of transnational law as an instrument for social justice. Let us assume, as the literature suggests, there, that there already exists in embryo a body of transnational law governing labor and social rights, human rights more generally, and even, as Boa proposes, a jus humanitatis. Let us suppose as well, contrary to the facts, that the widely recognized regime of Lex Mercatoria has begun to incorporate principles that ensure basic fairness for the subordinate party in contractual dealings to debtors, consumers, franchisees, and so on. Let us imagine, in other words, that my counterfactual was indeed factual, and that the law of economic subordination and resistance has already emerged in the interstices 
of transnational law. Let's imagine that. What would that imply? What would it mean? I have to be careful here. It would not mean nothing. And given circumstances, this new body of law could be used to embarrass corporate wrongdoers, educate public opinion, elicit remedial action from governments that now and again want to do the right thing. But that's the problem. Unfortunately, the history of labor law tells us under what given circumstances this new branch of law would likely be effective. When labor law lost its power, sorry, when labor lost its power, labor law became a lost cause. And until other economically subordinate communities regain the power that labor has lost, my thought experiment will not succeed. There will never be a transnational law of economic subordination and resistance, to speak plainly, unless and until governments have the power to do economic harm to corporations and political harm to governments. International conventions and covenants universally recognize social rights, corporate best practices and codes of conduct, principles of contract and soft law regimes. None of these will matter much unless the people who do not now have power are somehow able to mobilize effectively and on a broad front. This will not be easy. The labor movement is clearly disempowered. Most other subordinate groups have so far proved unable or unwilling to mobilize, or when they do mobilize, to stay mobilized and focused for a sustained period of time. Further, many such groups mistrust each other, and that mistrust prevents the formation of broad coalitions. And finally, the complexity of global markets largely hides corporations and governments from scrutiny and shields them from pressure. In short, the same circumstances that have led to existing imbalances of wealth and power across the global economy and in national economies are also preventing the emergence of new legal technologies of resistance. So why then should we bother with thought experiments like the law of economic subordination and resistance? Why should we trouble ourselves about the emergence or non-emergence of a regime of transnational labor law? One strong proponent of transnational law answers these questions in the following way. The conceptualization of transnational law as a new legal field, he says, might help both juristic practice and socio-legal scholarship by making it possible to organize, link, and compare what often appear as very disparate and problematic, but increasingly significant types of regulation. The same might be said for the law of economic subordination and resistance. And then he makes an even more important claim. I quote, the attempt to clarify the nature of transnational law forces a fundamental reconsideration of relationships between the public and the private, between law and state, and between different sources of law and legal authority. I agree with the, those claims, and I'm going to add yet another more compelling claim that supports the making of thought experiments. Their great virtue is that they remind us of the tenuous connection between legal representations of social relations and their reality. Concern, even outrage about that divergence, I should add, is what has caused the current explosion of excellent labor law scholarship as many scholars suggest ways to rescue, to revise, to replace existing obsolete or failed attempts in that field. 
but alas, much of that scholarship, mine included, is unlikely to produce practical real-world consequences. So will transnational law suffer the same fate as labor law? Will it come to be regarded as another thought experiment that was intellectually provocative but did not achieve its ambitious objectives of bringing the rule of law and the regime of justice to a globalized world. The notion I want to leave you with is this. We cannot, we must not, romanticize transnational law. Transnational law is very much like national law, only more so. It shares the strength of national law, but also its weaknesses. It's often inaccessible to those who need it most. Like national law, when it's invoked, it's often ineffective. And worst of all, like national law, it reflects and frequently reinforces existing power relations, but is far less often, but far less often it succeeds in revising those power relations. How then do we establish a just and effective regime of transnational law? Just as we do with national law, by broad-based political and social mobilization, by winning the intellectual and cultural battle for people's hearts and minds, by organizing and demanding and pressuring for reform of the economic order that the law is meant to govern. In other words, by making the law of economic subordination and resistance a global reality. Thank you. <laughs>